It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Greg Niemeyer. Um, he is an artist, uh, which is not typically a collaboration you see with engineers and clinicians, uh, but he uh, focuses on a very interesting area of, uh, of uh, uh, computer science, uh, gaming, and art, and has applications for healthcare. So, Greg. Thank you, Ravi. I just landed at the Sacramento airport. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me, uh, Ravi, and uh, thanks, Citrus. Um, I'm uh, talking about gaming and medicine, but to some of you, this may appear to be somewhat of a question. So the golden seal there has covered up the question mark, but now we can move on and uh, uh, see what we want to talk about. My interest in games actually goes back to collaboration with Dr. Chris Bolio at Stanford University, who did a virtual colonoscopy work early on. And he uh, and I developed a, a sort of a video uh, movie adventure uh, of a virtual colonoscopy adventure view. And the idea at the time was if the patients could um, l watch that movie and um, uh, shoot the, uh, the cancer gens or the, uh, the, um, the polyps by, the, uh, you know, by interacting as if they were interacting with the video game, that'd be a lot of fun. And we talked about that very casually, but uh, since then I've been studying games more formally and it turns out that games actually are uh, a wonderful place to look at how people relate to each other. And in medicine, of course, how people relate to each other is a huge topic in terms of delivering medical services to the end user patient. And so I want to uh, take a brief excursion into anthropology and look at a book that uh, Roger Caillois wrote about man play and games is the title. And uh, he um, um, uh, wrote down some fundamental thoughts about games that are very important. Number one, games are free in that we engage in games in a free way. We don't, we can't be forced to play. We have to be invited to play, uh, like vampires being invited into a door or house, perhaps. We have to willingly uh, uh, be in, 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 in the game context. Uh, games are separate from RL, which new media people are know is called real life, right? Games are separate from real life. They're, they happen in a magic circle. Games are rule-based processes, so they're uh, places where uh, the, the rules of the world have been simplified and now we are looking at a uh, limited set of rules with which we make a simple situation uh, uh, more, in, more interesting and focus on that simple situation. And also games are temporary, temporarily limited, that means they, are, uh, they have a beginning and an ending. Uh, so that is, that is his basic observation and then he went on to say, well, w when we play, what kind of people are we? And uh, how does, how does playing affect our, our sense of um, connecting with other people? What are the modes in which we participate in games? And he came up with four categories, mimesis, which is uh, you know, copying what somebody else is doing, and uh, vertigo, which has to do with, with dizziness, but really has to do with sensory deprivation. So there's a whole way of being in a game that has to do with uh, uh, limiting the senses that we normally have access to and focusing on very particular things. For example, um, not saying a particular word in a game might be a, a way of uh, limiting a sense, or covering your eyes and playing hide and seek, or hiding your body somewhere, those are all uh, aspects of these games that, examples of these games that belong to the category of vertigo. And chance, of course, has to do with randomness, and, and randomness is um, uh, a core part of game engines, and we find that in many, many different games. And finally, competition, which is most, uh, most noticeable in sports, of course, but these are the four modes in which we are present inside a game. Um, infor information technology network all these modes of play, and uh, we now have uh, online and electronic versions of all these modes of play that are very elegant and uh uh, it's important, however, to point out that these modes are different from genres. Game genres are like there's a role-playing game, there's a first-person shooter, there's a puzzle game, and so forth. But each of these genres of games are more like marketing language, and so so they have all of these elements of uh, all of these modes of play built into them. But the modes are very different from the genres. So so that's in in the uh, nascent field of game studies. That's how we parse through games, and we try to see. What do the point of making the studies? We try to find out what do people learn when they play games? How do they transform? How do they become a different person as they enter a game space? And when they're done playing, do they take any of the lessons they learned and uh, uh, leave as, as, as modified, transformed people? Um, 
So uh, a couple of observations that are a little more contemporary. Kaiwa wrote his book in the 50s. And uh, so, so today we can look at games more as uh, coming mostly from computer uh, uh, training and uh, programming and uh, sort of the world view that comes with networked uh, information. Uh, we can look at yeah, games in different ways. Games are models of dynamic processes. They are uh, uh, tools of engagement. This one is very important. Games are, are ways in which two people can interact with each other very quickly and very uh, focused manner. And the whole rest of the world, uh, all the things they do normally fall away and suddenly they're just looking at the roll of a dice or at the flash of a card. And, and, and these two, so they're tools of engagement. They're very rapid and they may be very useful for negotiating certain types of um, uh, relationships between uh, patients and uh, doctors as well. I'm getting a one-minute signal, so I have to um, move on very quickly here. So um, we're going to skip through this, and I'm going to go to the... Uh, this is the original drawing that talked about um, uh, uh, going through the, uh, through the colon and trying to find polyps or, you know, uh, and, uh, and uh, shooting those. And here's a version of a game that we developed where we actually did that, but instead of going through the colon, we went through the, from the bottom of the lung to the tip of the tongue, and we had uh, 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 d disease agents here, I don't know what they are. We, we didn't specify them either, but you had to um, sing, and so you, by singing with this interface, you could um, uh, try and uh, uh, d destroy these uh, um, pathogens here that are in the way of the um, in the way of the uh, trachea, and uh, so that was a fun game that we uh, presented in an art context, and people love playing it and uh, navigated through it just using their voice. So. Um, the game that I've developed more recently is the balance game, and this one was actually sold, uh, licensed by a, uh, a physiotherapy company not named Metitour from Finland. I noticed there's somebody here from Finland, so maybe you know that company. And uh, yeah, t and so Metitour makes a, a force plate, a sensor plate that um, measures balance and coordination, and uh, so how, we, how rapidly do we um, balance, adjust our balance to changing situations is what force plates tell us. And so we didn't know about this. We in our lab we at BID uh, at Berkeley Institute for Design we built a, a force plate on our own and we uh, put people on it and we saw, looked at what is fun, what are fun things to do and what is mo uh, engaging and motivational with balance and so we came up with this game that allows you to shift from left to right and from front to back uh, and in, while shifting you tilt this plate, this virtual plate uh, um, to deflect balls of a certain color, you see a red ball here is bouncing on a plate and it's going to want to fly into the red hoop here. And there's balls of different colors that drop at different times. So it's all about as if you were walking down a sidewalk and there were lots of challenges appearing on this in the three-dimensional world. But here the challenges are, of course, stimuli, simulated stimuli. And uh, there's no danger of falling or hurting yourself. So you can, you can uh, 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 improve your balance rapidly. The other thing about uh, games that's very important is games adapt to people's performances. And so we write um, software that makes the game harder and harder as people progress. So I, uh, I'm, I'm here to call for collaboration. I'm interested mostly in uh, seeing if we could make a clinical trial to see if playing a, a game like the balance game actually improves uh, human balance in a measurable way. Can we prove this? Is it, is it therapeutic in any way? Uh, I think my teacher might be interested in that as well. I, I don't know if they're doing any formal tests. I don't think so. I'm interested in seeing if there's games uh, that we could develop to diagnose specific sensory deprivations or specific uh, cognitive functions being present or not present. Um, and uh, I'm also interested in seeing if we could build a model for the state of a hospital since, since games are models of entire states of, uh, of, uh, of complex systems. If we could walk into the emergency room and we'd see how many doctors there are, how many patients there are, what's going on. We wouldn't uh, have such a hard time waiting, but we could see the whole state of a hospital summarized in the model of a game. Thank you very much. Have you ever thought of games that could enhance the developmental abilities of some young children with neurodevelopmental disorders, maybe focusing on specific neuropsych deficits? Um, I believe most games are designed 
to help us learn something. Usually they help us learn, become more violent, and that's, that's just a reflection of what our society is up to. But actually it is very easy to, to take any of these models and, of game, uh, gameplay and apply them to specific uh, situations like that. I'd be very happy to do that. I'm, I don't understand the, the medical aspect of it well enough, but once you understand what a person really needs to work on, precisely. You can design not uh, the game assets, so make sure that the game doesn't look like something that does what you want it to do, but it actually operates. So games are abstractions of functions, not abstractions of appearances. And so it's very important to figure out what is the function that we need to abstract here so that, this, that the patient can learn and, and, and gain some therapy value. Okay, one question, that was it, huh? That's all right.